It's finally time to use these ordinals to prove Goodstein's theorem. Let's recall our notation. B sub BD is the hereditary base change function. B sub BD of n is what happens if we write n in hereditary base B and then change every B to a D. The Goodstein sequence starting with n is a sequence of values, gi of n, where g1 of n is always n. If gi of n is 0, then the sequence terminates at i. And as long as gi of n is greater than 0, gi plus 1 of n is the value b sub i plus 1 i plus 2 of gi of n minus 1. And the theorem we're trying to prove is that for every n, there is an i so that gi of n is equal to 0. The way we connect these to ordinals is by adding a new twist to the hereditary base change formula. When n is a number, b sub b omega of n is the ordinal that we get by writing n in hereditary base b and then replacing all of the b's with omegas and the usual addition with ordinal addition. So in hereditary base 2, 26 is 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 0, etc. And when we replace those all with omegas, b2 omega of 26 is omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to the 0, etc. So for any natural numbers, b greater than 1 and n, b sub b omega of n is an ordinal below epsilon 0. This connection is why the ordinals below epsilon 0 are related to the Goodstein sequence. In fact, Goodstein was thinking in the opposite direction. Goodstein knew about the ordinals, and he invented hereditary base n notation exactly so there would be this correspondence between the ordinals and hereditary base notation. We said we were going to assign ordinals to these sequences to use as a timer. So we're going to define ordinals gamma i of n, which is going to be equal to b i plus 1 of omega of g i of n. Gamma i of n is the timer which corresponds to g i of n. So starting with n, we should imagine two sequences that go in parallel, the sequence of numbers g i of n and the sequence of ordinals gamma i of n. And the idea is that even though g i of n might keep increasing for a long time, the ordinals gamma i of n will always decrease. Let's try this out with a simple example. When we start with 3, g1 of 3 is 3, and in hereditary base 2 notation, that's 2 plus 1. So gamma 1 of 3 is omega plus 1. Then g2 of 3 is 3 plus 1 minus 1, so 3. So gamma 2 of 3 is omega. Notice that even though the Goodstein sequence stayed the same, the ordinal decreased. Next, g3 of 3 is 4 minus 1, which is 3 again, or if you prefer, 4 to the 0 plus 4 to the 0 plus 4 to the 0. So gamma 3 of 3 is omega to the 0 plus omega to the 0 plus omega to the 0. And from there, both sequences just decrease by 1 at each step. To take just the beginning of a longer example, we start with n equals 4. So g1 of 4 is 4. In hereditary base 2, that's 2 to the 2. So gamma 1 of 4 is omega to the omega. And then the next step, g2 of 4, is 3 to the 3 minus 1, which is 26. So gamma 2 of 4 is the equivalent with omegas. And we can write out the next few steps of both sequences. The Goodstein sequence might keep increasing, but notice that the ordinals, the gamma sequence, is decreasing at every single step. And if we can prove that, if we can prove that for every i and every n, gamma i plus 1 is less than gamma i of n, we'll almost be done. No matter what's happening with the Goodstein sequence, these ordinals we assigned really are going to give a countdown. This mostly falls out of looking at the definition. By definition, gamma i of n is b sub i plus 1 of omega of g i of n. It shouldn't be surprising that that's the same as b sub i plus 1 omega of b sub i plus 1 i plus 2 of g i of n. The first one says, take all the i plus 1s and turn them into omegas. And the second one says, 
take the i plus 1s, turn them into i plus 2s, and then turn the i plus 2s into omegas. Gamma i plus 1 of n is defined to be b sub i plus 2 omega of g i plus 1 of n, which is equal to b sub i plus 2 omega of b sub i plus 1 i plus 2 of g i of n minus 1. To make this a little clearer, take this common part b i plus 1 i plus 2 of g i of n and give it a name. Call it c. Gamma i of n is b sub i plus 2 omega of c, while gamma i plus 1 of n is b sub i plus 2 omega of c minus 1. So all we need to prove is that for any x and any base b, b sub b omega of x is less than b sub b omega of x plus 1. More generally, we're going to prove by induction on y that whenever y prime is less than y, then b sub b omega of y prime is less than b sub b omega of y. So let's assume the inductive hypothesis. For every y less than x plus 1, assume we've already proven that whenever y prime is less than y, b sub b omega of y prime is less than b sub b omega of y. We're going to prove that b sub b omega of x is less than b sub b omega of x plus 1. And then since we already know the claim for x, the inductive hypothesis will tell us that whenever y prime is less than x plus 1, b sub b omega of y prime is less than b sub b omega of x plus 1. It's easiest to look at what happens when we write x plus 1 in hereditary base b notation. x plus 1 in hereditary base b is going to be some sum of terms, b to the this plus b to the that. We're mostly interested in the last term, the one with the smallest exponent. So let's write that x plus 1 is equal to a plus b to the d, where a and d are themselves written in hereditary base b notation, and d is the last term, the smallest exponent. We're going to use the inductive hypothesis later, so notice that x plus 1 is at least b to the d, so d must be smaller than x plus 1. For example, if x plus 1 is 5, in hereditary base 2, we have 5 equals 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 0, so a is the 2 squared term, and d is 0. When x plus 1 is 104 in hereditary base 2, 104 is 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 1, etc. These first two terms are a, and 2 squared plus 1 is d, the last exponent. a is allowed to be 0. If x plus 1 is 8, then in hereditary base 2, we have 8 equals 2 to the 2 plus 1, so a is 0, and d is 2 plus 1 again. Then b sub b omega of x plus 1 is going to be alpha plus omega to the delta, where alpha is b sub b omega of a, and delta is b sub b omega of d. The hereditary base change function is preserving the structure. If a happens to be 0, alpha also happens to be 0, and that's fine. Now, Consider what happens when we write x in hereditary base b notation. If d equals 0, then x is just a. x plus 1 was a plus b to the 0, which is a plus 1, so x is equal to a. So b sub b omega of x is just alpha, which is less than b sub b omega of x plus 1, which was alpha plus 1. For instance, when x plus 1 is 5, b sub b omega of 5 is omega to the omega plus 1, well, b sub b omega 4 is omega to the omega. If d is greater than 0, we have to use our knowledge of how writing things in base b works. When we take 1 away from b to the d, we get b minus 1 copies of b to the d minus 1, plus b minus 1 copies of b to the d minus 2, and so on. That is, x is equal to a plus b to the d minus 1 times b minus 1, plus b to the d minus 2 times b minus 1, plus dot dot dot, all the way down to plus b minus 1, that is plus b to the 0, which is 1, times b minus 1. When x plus 1 is 635,230,000, in hereditary base 10, this is 10 to the 9 plus 10 to the 9 plus 10 to the 9 6 times, plus 10 to the 8 plus 10 to the 8 plus 10 to the 8, and so on. 
plus 10 to the 5. All these early terms, 635,220,000 of them, are A, and the very last term, the last 10 to the 5, is D. And when we subtract 1, we get 635,229,999, because 10 to the 5 minus 1 is 10 to the 4 times 9 plus 10 to the 3 times 9, and so on. So when we convert x to an ordinal, b sub b omega of x is alpha plus omega to the b sub b omega of d minus 1 plus omega to the b sub b omega of d minus 1, b minus 1 times, plus omega to the b sub b omega of d minus 2, b minus 1 times, and so on. But by the inductive hypothesis, all these pieces b sub b omega of d minus i they're all less than b sub b omega of d. So matter, no matter how many times I add together omega to the b sub omega of d minus i, they add to something less than omega to the b sub b omega of d. In particular, b sub b omega of x is alpha plus finitely many terms that are less than omega to the b sub b omega of d. So b sub b omega of x is less than alpha plus omega to the b sub b omega of d, which is what b sub b omega of x plus 1 is. And that completes the proof of the lemma. For every x, b sub b omega of x is less than b sub b omega of x plus 1. And that was the last step we need to prove that these ordinals gamma i of n are decreasing. The gamma sub i plus 1 of n is always less than gamma i of n. And that completes the proof of Goodstein's theorem. Even though this Goodstein sequence, g i of n, seems to get big, this associated sequence of ordinals, gamma i of n, is strictly decreasing. Since the ordinals are well-founded, they eventually hit zero after finitely many steps. And when they do, that means the Goodstein sequence must also have reached zero.